If you could turn to Romans 11, please. I would like you to have your Bibles opened. If you do not have your Bible here today, can I encourage you to bring your Bible? Because it's the Word of God, and as you read it in your own Bible, you will understand better where to find it next time. I have said this before, but this Bible I ordered from the United States. I paid a lot of money for it. Why? Because it was identical to my old Bible. Okay? It was an old edition. And I, want, I know that Romans chapter 11 starts there. And I know that in Philippians chapter 2 that Peter mentioned this morning, it's over there in my Bible. Okay? So we need to be students of the Word of God. We must be students of the Word of God. And as I get towards the end of my um, passage this morning in Romans 11, maybe you'll understand a little bit more of um, why I'm saying this. So please bring your Bibles to church, open them up. Uh, one of the reasons for me putting it on the PowerPoint is simply so you know where I'm at. You know which verses that I am referring to. Okay? Um, but I would strongly advise you to read it in your own Bible as I read it. I'm not going to read the whole passage in one go. It's fairly lengthy. So please bear with me. But let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we would ask that this morning you would speak loudly through your word. Lord, not only would we ask that you speak loudly, because, and we also know that sometimes you speak very softly. So Lord, help us to be attuned to you. Help us to listen. Help us to, to understand that this is your word that we're looking at. We're not here for entertainment. Lord, we're not here to be interested. We're here to learn your word. And help us. To, to, to be interested in your word, Lord, to be, to be desiring it, to be thirsting after it. As we see in Psalm 119, that, that David, I presume he, he wrote it, Lord, that, that the word of God, your word, Father, was important to him, and I pray that it would be important to us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So I just want to start off, a couple of weeks ago I spoke from Romans chapter 9 and then Al Watson spoke from Romans chapter 10 and now today I'm speaking from Romans 11. Uh, the problem with the, not so much a problem, but the issue with these particular chapters is they can be quite controversial. Um, and so I will present what I feel is the best fit as an explanation for it. And uh, my object today should not be to present a nice and complete and tight argument one way or the other. My job is to present the word of God. I will give you what I feel is, is um, my understanding of it because I'm here to teach. But uh, you need to go away and you need to look at the scriptures and to examine whether what I'm saying is, is the truth. Okay? Um, our future depends on it. Hold that thought. But a couple of weeks ago when I spoke from Romans chapter um, 9... I meant to use this, this overhead, and I think it's just essential that we understand that Romans 9, 10, and 11 very much about the sovereignty of God, but also we have a responsibility. So when we get to heaven, and we, you know, this is just an illustration. We're not going to see that sign necessarily. But um, it says, whoever will may come. So the gospel is open to whoever wants to come to Christ. But when we get through and we look back, once we've gone through the gate and we look back, that's the sign that we see, chosen in Christ. And so God, he is sovereign. He chooses us. And the Bible tells us that he chooses us. The Bible tells us that God is sovereign. So the end result for me um, is that we're, we're chosen by God, but also we must choose. Just like Joshua, choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. And so we need to choose the Lord Jesus Christ. But today, the, the big question, and I'll just go back a moment, is has God finished with Israel? And he has not. I'm talking about the nation of, uh, of Israel, the ethnic Jews. Okay, that's, that's the, the question that Paul is addressing here. And I'm hoping that by the end of chapter 11, by the end of today, you'll understand just... Um, just that fact that God still has a future for Israel as a nation. And so we'll, we'll, we'll go through it. And um, so the thing is, 
the question is, and this is what Paul asks in, in the very first verse, um, you know, has God rejected Israel completely? And um, I think partially only and temporarily only. In other words, not every Jew rejects Christ. Okay? Uh, so it's only, only part, and there are obviously, there are Christians. A couple of weeks ago when we couldn't have church because of COVID, um, uh, the, the, what, the speaker that was going to come was actually a, a guy, Mark uh, Lundrum, who we'll try and get a, later in the year, who reaches out to Jewish people. He's Jewish and he reaches out to Jewish people. There are Jewish Christians around. So it's only been partially uh, what has happened where God has pushed the Israelites aside. And I'll, ex I'll explain that to you in a moment. Um, but it's only temporarily as well. In other words, God does have a plan for Israel. And so we, we read in Samuel when the people desired to have a king, Samuel said to them, um, you know, in spite of their sin, the people said, we have sinned. Uh, Samuel said, for the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. The people of Israel, ethnic Israel, those that have descended through Abraham, then Isaac, then uh, Jacob and his 12 sons, uh, the patriarchs, um, that God chose them. God chose them as his people. Now, has God finished with Israel? Well, in that particular case, if you think no, that God, that, sorry, if you think that God has finished with Israel, please explain 1948. Because what happened in 1948? Israel became a nation. In 70 AD, the Romans had uh, destroyed Rome, dispersed the vast majority of Jewish people around the world, and they stayed dispersed around the world until 1948. Actually, the process started before that. Um, but the people of, of Jew, Jewish origin, uh, first of all, they had maintained their identity. See, many, many cultures over the years of history have become assimilated into other cultures and have lost their identity, not the Jewish people. What's the only thing that can explain that? God's sovereignty, God's power. These are, are a people that are still identifiable as God's people and God has kept them. So what we need to, uh, I think it's a good Thing at this point, just to go through this fairly difficult chapter, it's difficult in the sense of, of what, what does Paul really mean. Uh, it's good just to have an initial summary. I'll have a summary at the end as well. Um, but it, the Israelites were meant to be God's witnesses to the world. Um, they were meant to declare the existence and glory of God. Um, they were meant to, to reveal the Messiah. Well, first off, they rejected the Messiah. They had him crucified, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, it's interesting to declare the existence and glory of God. What's part of the glory of God? It's God's love and forgiveness. Did you notice the, be, the behavior of Jonah in the Old Testament? He did not want to tell people about God's love and forgiveness. He didn't want to go to the people of Nineveh and tell them to repent because he knew God would, would love them, that God would forgive them. And Jonah didn't do, want to do it. He's one of these Israelites that just didn't fulfill his task. He, was, in a sense, was forced by God to do that. And even when God did forgive, he still got his nose, um, Jonah still got his nose out of joint. Um, but the, the problem was that Israel failed in their task, particularly in rejecting the, the Messiah. So what has happened, and this is the story of Romans 11, um, that, that God turns to the Gentiles um, in, in, um, in Romans 10, 21, it actually says, now, but concerning Israel, he says, all day long I've held my hands out to a disobedient and obstinate people. That's the very verse before chapter 11. This is what God's doing, but he's dealing with a, a, a nation, Israelites, that just continually caused problems, even in the book of Judges, up and down, up and down in their response to God. And... Um, that's, and they're still obstinate. They are still, as a nation, rejecting the, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. So God has turned to the, the Gentiles, that is, anyone who's not a Jew. Um, and so the, the Gentiles have become the objects of God's sovereign grace. God's still saving Jewish people. 
There's still a remnant today, but uh, the, the, the Gentiles have become God's vehicle for spreading the gospel. So, and that's what seems to be happening today and has been happening uh, through the vast majority of, of history since, uh, since biblical times. And why is God doing this? Why has he pushed Israel aside? Why is he showing favour to the, the Gentiles? To make Israel jealous. Because he still has a plan for them. To, to bring them back to himself. And um, you, know, you see once again in chapter 10, verses 19 to 20, um, this is what Moses said. He said, I will make you envious by those who are a nation. Uh, who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. I was found by those who did not seek me. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. These are the Gentiles that God is talking about. God is working uh, um, through us to, and showing us grace and mercy, us as in Gentiles, so that he might make Israel jealous because he still wants them to come to him. He's, he's, see, the thing is, God has made promises. Promises that he refuses to go back on. And this is why we, we need to understand God's sovereignty. Don't rob God of his sovereignty. Or don't attempt to rob God of his sovereignty, please. So in the scriptures, God, we, we can see that God is, is the one. He, he does the choosing. We have to choose. We have to choose him as well. Um, and I think I made that point in chapter 9, that as we look at um, this, this whole issue of God's sovereignty and our, if you like, free will, um, we can't equate them. But I think both are pretty evident in Scripture and God is able to put that together because he's God. Let's not, under, not only underestimate God's sovereignty, let's not underestimate the, the power, the wisdom and the knowledge of God. And we certainly come to the, at the end of this chapter to a doxology that actually says that. Um, so let me just... Um, yeah, so the, the bottom line is that Israel will turn back to God. God will, will ensure that that happens. But let's, let's have a look. Let's have a look at it. Well, I've, in this chapter, there are five proofs or five witnesses or five pieces of evidence that suggest that Israel still has a future. And the first one is, if we look at uh, verse 1 of Romans 11, I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, Paul's not just describing himself as a spiritual Israelite, he's describing himself as an ethnic Israelite. You Stephen talks about his tribe. Um, so when I talk about Jewish people, I know, okay, probably more specifically that's referring to those that are of the tribe of Judah, um, but I, I think it's, it's now become synonymous with the people of Israel when we talk about Jews. And uh, um, Paul was a Benjamite, he came from the, the tribe of Benjamin. But, you know, it, it, to me, it sets the scene for the rest of this, that God is talking about the Israel as a nation. He's talking about ethnic Israel. So let's, let's move on. Um, another proof, and that is that um, at the time of um, what Paul's talking about is in his day and age is just like it was with Elijah. So let's have a look and just read the, the next portion, um, verses 2 down to, to 10. God did not reject his people, whom he foreknew. Don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he was appealed, so how he appealed to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. And what does God answer to him? I have reserved for myself seven thousand who have not bowed the knee to Baal. That's an idol. So too. At the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. Right, that? Chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it's no longer by works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then? What Israel sought to so earnestly, it did not obtain. But the elect did. The others were hardened. As it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes so that they could not see, and ears so that they could not hear. And to this very day, and David says, may their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution to them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent 
forever. See, that's that last little passage there, that last little bit of that, um, backs being bent forever. That's what happens when you try to get to heaven by works, by doing good things. See, we often find it referring to the law. And you think, all right, I'm not a Jew, so the law is not relevant to me, so this whole argument's not relevant to me. Um, Paul's referring to, to the law, but in doing so, he's showing us the impact or the lack of impact of works. So for us as Gentiles, if we're predominantly Gentiles here, um, that he's talking about works, about what we do to try and win God's approval. And this passage is showing us, for Israel, for us, it is by grace. By grace are you saved. Notice that? that? It says, by grace are you saved. Then, this is Ephesians, um, Ephesians chapter 2, uh, by grace are you saved through faith. But it's start with grace. It's God's grace that, that uh, leads to us being, being saved. And so this, this situation that Elijah is facing is similar to what's happening today. Paul's saying in his day and age, God's got a remnant. And I believe that, uh, and a lot of other writers would say the same, that God always has a remnant. Even today, there are believing Jews. Yeah. E.g. Mark Lundrum and his wife Rahel and the people that work for these various Jewish uh, organisations that are reaching out to the Jewish people and they're seeing fruit in their works. Um, but the, the, look, the, the bottom line is it's God's sovereign electing grace because the problem is that grace and works are mutually exclusive. You can't have one and the other, not, not as a way of uh, gaining God's approval. We are chosen by grace, okay? So we, we, um, we choose to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. We exercise faith. And in exercising faith, then we find God's Holy Spirit comes within us. And then we, after that, we find my attitude's changing. I want to serve God. I want to give up my old way of life. And in that sense, those works that we talked about are a way of gaining God's approval are actually the fruit of our lives because first and foremost, we have chosen the Lord Jesus Christ. We have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's, it, I think it's really important to understand that um, in all of this, that um, salvation belongs to the Lord. He's the one that decides. He's the one who is sovereign God. Um, but the, the wonderful thing is, you know, there are things happening in Scripture and things happening now with God at work. I don't understand. You don't understand. What does the Apostle Paul? Now I know in part. But I, when I meet the Lord, I'm going to know in full. I'm going to know even as I am known. And that's the, that's the thing. We're dealing with partial knowledge now. Oh, I'd just love to get things into a nice, neat little package and then I can present it to you. Uh, it doesn't always work that way. And I've got to tell myself, Reef my life, snap out of it. Okay. Um, it's, it's a case of um, God's going to do what God go is going to do and he is sovereign. But it, it, when we look at um, you know, verse 7, it, uh, for example, it says that, uh, what then? What Israel sought so earnestly, it did not obtain, but the elected. And the others were hardened. See, God, God hardens hearts. He has hardened the hearts of Israel, of ethnic Israel. Um, he says in Isaiah 29, verse 13, um, the Lord says, These people come near me with their mouth and honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me. So the worship of me is made up only of rules taught by men. And this is the problem that um, Israel sought to gain acceptance from God by just simply the deeds that they did. It's got to be internal. It's got to be a, a, um, a heart commitment to the Lord. And that's, that's the thing that we want to preach here. But it's not a matter of turning up to church. It's not even a, a matter of just saying to God, I'm sorry for my sins, full stop. There's a, there's a place for that, but not in terms of gaining acceptance. What does it say? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And then... Yeah, and, and we do need to commit uh, to tell God that we are sorry for our sins, but as part of believing in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, as, as Peter brought it to us this morning. See, 
Um, want to get? I just need to. I think we need to understand what are God's terms for coming to Him. And uh, you look at the weight of Scripture, and I think the weight of Scripture, in other words, how much in the Scripture speaks about certain things about God and about Him and about the Gospel, we need to pay attention to. Um, and then one of the things that is very prominent in Scripture is that we need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll just go through these very quickly. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. That was Paul's uh, words to the Philippian jailer. Um, oops, went too quickly there. But in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And in Acts 15, no, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved, just as they, we are. As, sorry, as they are, I should say. And in Galatians, I know that a man is not justified by observing the law, or works, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, or works. Because by observing the law, no one will be justified. And we won't be justified through works either. Okay, if we're seeking, and that's the story of Galatians, I think, uh, that if we're seeking acceptance from God on the basis of what we are doing, we are doomed to failure. Just like unbelieving Israel was. Okay, no unbelieving Israelite ever got into heaven or ever will get into heaven. Those Israelites, they were chosen, God's chosen people, but they, if they didn't believe, and, they, and uh, it was not impacting on their heart, then they won't be in heaven. Okay? Because God has always dealt with grace through faith. Always. Um, so the, the bottom line is you can't save yourself. It's by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, as we move through this particular passage, um, you know, this is another proof. And that is, look at what happens with the Gentiles. Verse 11. Again I ask, did they, this is talking about Israel, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. Notice that? That salvation has come to the Gentiles. God is treating the Gentiles as objects of his sovereign grace. As I said before. So in, in terms of this, just keep reading. Verse 12, but if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will be their fullness bring? Or in other words, when they come back to God. So Paul's expecting the Israelites, the Jews, to come back to God at some point in time. And we're given a hint as to when that will be. Uh, verse 13, I am talking to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles. I make much of my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. So Paul, Paul's fitting in with, um, with, with the way God's doing things. Verse 15, For if their rejection is the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be? But life from the dead. So we're finding that God is... Yeah, it's only partial and it's only temporary. Okay, Because the, the thing is that, that with the Israelites, that... Israel's fall was a stumble. They, are, they have not fallen beyond recovery. Paul says, not at all. Okay? He uses that word. He's being quite emphatic. He says, no, they haven't permanently fallen. God hasn't cast them off permanently. He he's, uh, still has a time where he's going to be reaching out to them. For the moment, as a nation, they have been pushed aside but not permanently and, and, and certainly not uh, as a whole group because we see you know, Jews are being saved. Um, but the, the, point, you know, the point of God pushing the Jews to the side and reaching out to the Gentiles is restorative. That's its nature. God wants to restore <coughs> Israel to himself. That's his purpose. He wants to make them jealous. And we saw that in chapter 10 as well, that Paul is following through within his own ministry. Um, so it's, it's only, t only temporary and it's only partial. You notice how you keep on using those words because I think that gives us a good insight into this whole area. Um, so God has turned to the Israelites. Okay, now looking at verse 16, some people say that this is uh, probably the most important 
part of the passage in understanding just what God is doing. Let me read it through. Um, Verse 16. If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. Let me just stop there. That's referring to Numbers uh, chapter 15. Okay? the, The people of Israel, when they went into the land, they had to provide a sacrifice. It's called uh, first fruits. And uh, the thing is that the the first of their crop they had to dedicate to the Lord. And what that meant was that the rest of the harvest was coming and it was going to be okay. They presented the first fruits to God, often the best part of it. I had a mandarin tree that I grew, still at home, um, but the first time I had fruit off it, that, that was the best fruit I've ever had from, from that tree. Okay, the rest of the time, it's, it's okay, but there's something about that first fruit. But in, in terms of Israel, that little gift to the Lord, the first fruits, made the rest holy. That's Paul's point. Those first few generations of Israelites, you know, particularly Abraham, because I believe that Abraham is, is the olive tree that we're going to read about in a moment. Uh, he's, he's the rootstock, and it's starting from there. Um, and then, but, but presenting that first fruits, you know, Abraham, he was holy. That makes the rest of the nation holy as well. Let's, let's develop this thought. Now Paul turns to a, a second metaphor. Um, and we'll just have a look at that. Second half of chapter, uh, of verse 16. If, if the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in amongst others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not boast over the branches. If you do, do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted. But they were broken off because of unbelief and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant. But be afraid, for God did not spare the natural branches. He will, if he did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. A little bit scary. Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God to those who fell, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise you also will be cut off. And if you, they do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. After all, you were cut out of an olive tree, which is wild by nature and contrary to nature, were grafted into a cultivated olive tree. How much more readily will those, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Now, I hope you got all that. Okay, I tried to come up with some pictures. But what happens is that when when you're growing olive trees, you can actually introduce other um, varieties of olive into it. What you do is you cut off the, uh, the branches, the existing natural branches of the olive tree, and you can actually implant um, branches or buds from other types of olives. Okay, and what it does is it, um, that they, they feed off each other in, the, in that sense, that it, uh, uh, those branches feed off the root system. Okay, so, but Paul's point is just simply the branches of the existing olive tree went bad. So he cut them off. Yeah, uh, Friday, I went into my neighbours to help them to cut up some things. And I looked across at their lemon tree. I said, they said, lemon tree doesn't produce as it should be. I said, I know what your problem is. They've got these lemons around the outside and the centre section is actually dead. I said, you need to cut that out. Okay? And that's what God has done, that he's cut out, cut out what is unproductive. And so Israel has been, as a nation, not all the individual Israelites, but as a nation, have been been cut out and put to the side, put to the side, not destroyed. Okay, don't don't apply this to the parable of the vine in in the Gospels. A different point is being made here. Um, But what happens is God has um, is growing an olive tree in in one sense. Okay, starts with Abraham. But now, the Gentiles have been grafted in. Okay, that's fine. So we've got to understand he's talking about the Gentile church in in this case. Okay, he's he's not talking about individuals. So when you read um, 
verse 12, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. He's talking to the, the church. And I, I think that this is a, a really, there's a really important lesson in this. Uh, I'll just move through this. Okay, so the natural branches have been broken off. The, the wild olive branches, that's the Gentiles, have been grafted on. Um, I'll, I might come back to those in a minute. They're just other ones. But what I want you to understand in this is that God continues to prune. God does prune. We're being told that. And what's happening is that, um, before I get to that, is that Israel, have, they've, they've turned their back on the Messiah. So God has removed them. He's grafted in the, the Gentile church. And, uh, but he's still got a, a future for, for Israel. But even then, if there are segments of the Gentile church that are unproductive, that actually don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, he will take them out. Okay? Now let's, so that's, that's where I want to have a look at Revelation 2. I think this is really important for us as a church at, here at C4, Campbelltown Christian Community Church, to understand that. The Ephesian church was a hard-working and persevering church, but they had lost their first love. What was their first love? The Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't love him. They were doing works. They got so involved in their works. Um, and and there, are, there are some good things that they were doing. But they lost their first love. That's, that's, that's the problem uh, that we need to be very, very careful of. See, what we've found, that by the time John was writing to the Ephesian church, you know, uh, and stating what Christ had said to him in his vision in, in Revelation chapter 2, probably was not the first generation of Christians in Ephesus. It would probably have been the second generation, maybe the third generation. There's a good number of years between the letter to Ephesus in, uh, uh, written by Paul and the book of Revelation written by the Apostle John. So th there's been a change of ownership in a sense. Later generations. And so what's, what's going to happen here? They were told to repent. And if they don't repent, God was going to remove their, um, their church, the, the Ephesian church, their, their candlestick. Did I get that right, Peter? Lampstand. Thank you. We, we had this discussion on Friday. Um, but it would remove their lampstand. And what's happened today? There's no Ephesian church. They didn't repent. We need to be very careful as a church here too because I believe that we are a hard-working church. But we need to make sure that as we go through our very first generation, second generation, third generation, and we're certainly up to that now, so the third generation's out there in Sunday school at the moment, but we need to make sure that we do not lose our first love. We need to love the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the... Um, the if you like, the, the, the key to our survival as a church here in Campbelltown. That we need to make sure that we do not lose our first love. How do you not lose your first love? Number one, you talk to the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, you read his word. Number three, you, you actually are obedient to the things that he's telling you. You listen to what the Holy Spirit is telling you. And as you grow... And as you love the Lord Jesus Christ, that's going to make a whole lot of difference to what you do in church, to how you impact on your family, to how you impact in your street, how you impact on your children, your great-grandchildren, etc. So we need to keep this in mind. Whether you are first generation here, second generation, or even third generation. Um, I think I'm third generation Christian because dad, it was dad's... Um, mum and dad that first became Christians that we're aware of. Okay? And, and so I'm, a th I'm third generation and I need to make sure that I haven't lost my first love. I want to encourage you in that. See, for Israel, they lost their love for the Lord. Uh, for God. And so that they're doing works. It's become mechanical. And in doing so, they didn't recognise the Messiah when he, come, when he came. And so we need to grow. And we need to be continuing to, to loving the Lord. I better move on. Sorry, but that, that was probably one of my, my key things. See, let's always remember that we are an ordinary people, but we have an extraordinary God. I've used that recently quite a few times because it's very much on my mind. I'm an ordinary guy, but I have an extraordinary God.
and you'd be amazed what you can do. Now, I've been told there are things that I would not do as I got older as a Christian. Okay? But, you know, I found I have been able to do them because I've, I've wanted to trust God. Uh, I, I, I do, yeah, I've laboured the point. You've got it, I'm sure. Okay. But the, the, the next one, right to the end, is that um, you look at what God's doing. Um, uh, there's a key word in there that I'm always looking for, and I can never find it, verse 29. Um, there it is, for God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Um, uh, you know, I can never pronounce the word right. You know what it means? Can't be changed. Irrevocable. Okay, I probably didn't need to have a lesson again. I practiced it this morning several times. Still got it wrong. But it's the point that God doesn't change his word. We can't change God's decisions. And God won't change his decisions. Because he's faithful to his word. It's in his nature. And so God never makes mistakes. When he makes promises, he knows what he's saying. And he has made promises to the people of Israel. Okay? Um, and he, he made promises to the patriarchs. That's what's in that particular pa passage. Um, and so the, the people of Israel, there's still some fulfilment to be carried out. Um, and how, and, but, but they've been hardened in their heart. When, were they, when will that happen? Sorry, when will that finish? When the full number of the Gentiles has come in. 